remote control, this is Edinburgh and Beyond. Please welcome the pub landlord, Mr Al Murray! Here on Paramount, the home of comedy, you lucky people. <laughs> what are you? Lucky people! That's right. At home, they're all sat, relaxed on the sofa with a curry cooling in their lap, enjoying the show. But what about our front row here? Because we've got a beautiful front row. <laughs> you chunky monkey here. What's your name, pal? <laughs> Richard, beautiful British name. What do you do, son? I'm a chef. You're a chef? God bless you. Hey, a fat chef. <laughs> <laughs> the right kind, eh? Hey? Do you want some crisps? <laughs> you passing out during the show. <laughs> he's like a furnace, he's got to keep going. Welcome. <laughs> You're here on your own, Ricky? No, I'm here with these two. You're here with those? There's no need to shout, pal. <laughs> Spudger ready! Spudger ready! <laughs> Spudger ready! You're fucking hot! Spudger ready! Calm yourself down, you're off duty. Now, you are. <laughs> we have to get geese down here with ears. What's your name, sir? <laughs> Pat. What'd you do, Pat? Cabby. A cabby. That's why he sat at the front, of course. But tell me. <laughs> how are you getting home tonight, then? By cab. By cab? <laughs> Did you bring your own park it up? <laughs> you tight bastard. <laughs> where are you going? Where are you, where are you heading? Surbiton. Surbiton. Anyone going to Surbiton? <laughs> you are. Fucking brilliant, Rosanna. <laughs> there you go. How much to Surbiton? About 30 quid. 30 quid? <laughs> you. In <laughs> Mind you, cabby out your car, you're like a mermaid on dry land, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> How do I get home? <laughs> <laughs> now, you're, you're beautiful people, I'll tell you, drinking with people like you, it, it's one of the reasons I'm proud to be British, and one of the most important things about being British, ladies and gentlemen, is of course God is British. Let's not forget that. <laughs> That's why we don't have earthquakes in this country. <laughs> <laughs> you don't shit in your own doorstep. But I. <laughs> Ask, ladies and gentlemen, if it's possible to prove God's existence. Well, yes, I see proof of God's existence everywhere, yeah, in the fact that the pint glass fits the male human hand. That proves <laughs> <laughs> only a merciful British God would have invented both the pint and the human being in the same world. Yeah, that proves us that proves a God, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't it, Pat? <laughs> Say it. Yeah, that proves us a God. Say it. <laughs> now, For my money, there is one thing that proves, above all else, the existence of God. And that, of course, Lane Jimmon, one thing that proves us a God, and that, of course, is the existence of bacon. Right? <laughs> bacon, yes. Bacon proves there's a God, right? Jesus Christ, our Lord, our men, yeah? yeah? He died on a Friday, came back from the dead on a Sunday. But bacon will bring you lot back to life on a Saturday morning, regardless of the fucking state you're in Friday night. <laughs> Proves there's a God. We all, we all love bacon. Even the vegetarians know this in their hearts. <laughs> their mung bean driven hearts beat for bacon. So we've all been there. Get to the pub, it's a Friday, it's after work. You're a bit knackered, yeah? You're not really that thirsty. So what do you do? You get a packet of crisps. The crisps, yeah, they get your thirst kick-started, don't you? You get a pint in, the pint makes you hungry. So you get another packet of crisps, eat the crisps, crisps make you thirsty, so you get a pint in. The pint makes you hungry, you get a packet of crisps. Crisps make you thirsty, get another pint in. The pint makes you hungry, get a packet of crisps. Crisps make you thirsty, yeah? You're eight pints down the line before you've even got started, basically. <laughs> Next thing you know, you switch to scratching, so a bit of dinner, then you're back on the pints again. <laughs> Yeah, by, by the time it's midnight, you've had 18 pints of quality lager. Somehow, you find your way home. Maybe with the assistance of a cab driver, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow you get home, you climb into your bed, and your skin is like a fetid rhino, stinking, salty hide. Your balls are like two bowling balls wrapped in sandpaper, <laughs> scraping against one another, chafing and aching. <laughs> Yeah, you're dehydrating rapidly, even though you've drunk a great deal of liquid. I can't figure that one out! <laughs> Somehow, you decide it's time to go to the toilet and vomit. You make your way to the toilet, you lie down on the floor and you feel the cold ceramic kiss of the toilet against you. <laughs> against you. And you puke, quietly, <laughs> to yourself, and fall asleep. <laughs> 
sick turns to jelly. <laughs> and you lie, as good as dead, in the bathroom. But Saturday morning, someone puts the bacon on. Don't they? <laughs> you smell that bacon, and you're back! <laughs> bacon proves the existence of God and proves that he's British because it demonstrates what a fantastic fucking sense of humour he's got. Yeah? Yeah, he's got a brilliant sense of humour, God, because he invented bacon, the greatest meat in the world, and then he didn't allow his chosen people to eat it. <laughs> Come on, yeah. yeah. And right now, he's up there laughing his arse off. <laughs> <laughs> now, another reason for our Father right in heaven to laugh his almighty arse off is this man, Lane Jim, and build up your applause now, if you will, as we welcome to the stage Richard Herring! Again. Thank you. Thanks very much. To be or not to be, that is the first and only question on the University of Beekeeping entrance exam. <laughs> the answer's A to B. <laughs> if you want to cheat, but you know. You'll only be cheating yourself. The Sphinx was unusual amongst mythological creatures. It had a riddle. If you could solve the riddle, it wouldn't kill you. Little gout claws, nice gimmick. The other mythological creatures should have thought of that. No one could get it, it was impossible. But it was still nice that he had the get out cause. Because Oedipus solved the riddle of the Sphinx. You may remember Oedipus. He's the bloke who so loved his mother, he killed his father and fucked her. <laughs> Mums prefer it if you just help round the house a bit. Uh, <laughs> flowers on Mother's Day. But the, um, the riddle of the Sphinx was what walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening. It's difficult. Oedipus said it was man, because a baby on hands and knees, four legs, kind of four legs, hands and knees, doesn't count. Old man has a cane, that's... It's not really a leg, is it? It doesn't really work. But I've come up with the correct answer to the riddle of the Sphinx. What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, three legs in the evening. It is, of course, Paul McCartney and his wife. <laughs> I don't think there's anything offensive about that. That's just mathematically correct. I'm making no... <laughs> no judgment on that one. Um, Jerry Hall girls had some advice on, on how to keep your man, so... That should be worth listening to, shouldn't it? <laughs> Jerry Hall's advice. Um, I can't wait. What she said goes, to keep your man, all you have to do is act like a cook in the kitchen, a maid in the parlour, and a whore in the bedroom. Better advice, though, girls, if you want to keep your man, is to act like a whore in every room of the house. <laughs> Most men won't really care what state the parlour has got into. <laughs> as long as you're whoring it up <laughs> in the airing cupboard. Uh, <laughs> if you're in a long-term relationship, like you two have been to together for... It's important to spice up your sex life to keep things interesting, because if you know, it can get very monotonous. You learn each other's tricks. You, yeah, you have to keep things spiced up to avoid the, the monotony, because it can, it can become very tedious, can't it? The, the same face gurning down at you, the, <laughs> the same disgusting body bobbing up and down. It can be... <laughs> it can be nauseating, can't it? To be like, <laughs> occasionally, you're, you're a little bit sick in the back of your throat, aren't you? <laughs> you have to swallow the sick, cos it's considered rude to vomit during intercourse, so... <laughs> You're there looking at this disgusting sight, taste of vomit, wanting to be... It's important to spice things up, too. <laughs> Avoid the nausea. I was in a long-term relationship a few years ago. I was going through a bit of a sexual malaise, trying to spice things up. I said to my girlfriend, why don't you bring your best friend to bed with us? Yeah. Three in a bed, yeah. Menage a toi. Yeah. Them lezzing up. <laughs> she said to me, you've got enough problem satisfying one woman at a time. <laughs> She think you could cope with two. She thought that was clever girls, thought she got me there. <laughs> she was so wrong. I, I said, well, that is the entire beauty of the system. When I'm done, you two can finish each other off for me. <laughs> whilst I sleep. <laughs> a woman knows what a woman wants and has the patience to see it through to its tedious conclusion. <laughs> 
she finished with me shortly after that conversation, so... <laughs> now I'm reduced to having one in a bed sex. <laughs> Menage à un. <laughs> Which has worked out great for me, because I forgot, I really like to have sex with someone that I pity. It's, uh, <laughs> the only way I can get off. Uh, <laughs> Is it who says potato anyway? Because <laughs> someone should tell them they're definitely pronouncing that wrong. There's no, there's no question about that. I don't think well, I'm not going to cause a fuss. Let's call the whole thing off. No, <laughs> that is the incorrect pronunciation of that word. Well, if you let that go, the person's going to go around thinking that's the correct pronunciation. A few years down the line, in a swanky restaurant with someone they want to impress, say to the snooty waiter, "Oh, does, does that come with potatoes?" <laughs> He's going to laugh, the girl's going to think, I'm not going to marry him, he's an idiot. <laughs> you have to go up to him, get a potato, go, look, what do you call that, mate? <laughs> and he'll go, go, that, that's easy, that is a potato. <laughs> go, no, mate, it isn't. You're the only person in the world who calls it that. <laughs> it's a potato, you know, you, you, you're being different for different sake, there's no point, you can't just pronounce words how you want, that it all will end in chaos. Where, where will it end? You say banana, I say banani. Uh, <laughs> you say kumquat, I say pomegranate. You see what I mean? It's got a, it's a potato. The only person who would call that a potato is Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> Peter Sellers, Inspector Clouseau, the evil Steve Martin pissing on the grave of a genius. <laughs> Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> what kind of arrogance or greed or stupidity could make a man think, you know what, yeah, I'll have a crack at Inspector Clouseau. No one's really nailed that part, yeah. <laughs> What a wanker. I wish uh, <laughs> the French don't say uh, potato, though. I, w I wish they did. Um, what the French say for that is pomme de terre, which literally means apple of the ground. A potato and an apple are not similar. That is not an apple of the ground. Look, there's a difference. Look, there you go. Look, they're different. <laughs> they're, they're both food stuff. That's it. Look, uh, uh, a potato is, is brown. Uh, uh, an apple's usually green. Uh, uh, potatoes are a vegetable. Uh, an apple's a fruit. Uh, a raw apple tastes delicious. A raw potato tastes like a man's semen. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> I've never eaten a raw potato. <laughs> You must have, you know, to what around, he must have come back from the New World. Gone, look, everyone, look, French people, we found this new thing. There it is. Uh, everyone's calling it a potato. Uh, there's one bloke calling it a potato. We're just ignoring him. <laughs> Why don't you call it a potato as well? And the French go, no, no, no. To this, this to us resembles nothing more than an apple. That if you hold that up to an apple, then it's like looking down le mirror. Look at that. <laughs> it's exact. The only difference we can see between this and an apple is the potato grows in the grounds. The apple grows down la arbre, <laughs> in the tree. I don't know why I only say certain phrases in French. The easiest ones is almost like I can't speak French. <laughs> So we're going to call it an apple of the ground, pomme de terre. You say potato, we say pomme de terre. Let's have a hundred years war. <laughs> I think we can satirise the French. We all have to do this, all the English-speaking world, everyone at home. Um, what we have to do in England is start referring to apples as potatoes of the sky. <laughs> Which actually is incorrect, it's quite a cool name. For, like, like, that is sky potatoes. That would liven Genesis up a bit, wouldn't it? Do you want a sky potato, Eve? Yeah, of course I fucking do. It wouldn't that sound like something off of Star Trek? <laughs> the reason this would be a good satire of the French, though, if you, if you think about it, when a French boy is at school learning English, um, the teacher will go up and go, look, voici la pomme, mais en Angleterre on dit la pomme de terre de ciel. <laughs> The French boy will say in French, what, so in England, they call an apple, an apple of the ground of the sky. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? Why would they do, why don't they just call it an apple? Why go through the rigmarole of going to that ground? Why don't they just call the French, the English language is stupid, the English are ridiculous. At which point I will burst into the classroom and go, no, little French boy, it is you who is stupid. <laughs> you and the entire French-speaking world for calling a potato an apple of the ground. It's not. You're wrong. <laughs> so, uh, thanks very much, it's been great. I'll just leave you with one thought. Uh, do you know, the best way to determine uh, the length of a man's penis, this is how it always works, I'm surprised this hasn't come out before. This is 100% guaranteed to work. The best way to determine the length of a man's penis is to get him to show it to you. 
<laughs> and then measure at the ruler. Always works. So I've had a great time. Hope you have. <laughs>